Am I on? Good morning. My name is Amos. I am one of the pastors here. And this is my beautiful, intelligent, wonderful, and sexy wife, Allison. I can say that because we are in the middle of a sex series, otherwise I might not. But yesterday I was uh, hopping around different parks and different gardens in the city of Philadelphia. The last place I ended up was Fairmount Park. You guys know where that is, right? And I noticed something a little strange uh, toward my end of my time. I saw two different individuals with selfie sticks taking pictures of themselves and their little dog. <laughs> I'm not judging. I actually can't judge. Because I... Pictures of yeah, your cats. Yeah, the cats. But uh, the second guy, <laughs> occasionally, I don't post them on Facebook though, I don't think. Uh, the second guy had a little doggy stroller. But his little doggy was not in the doggy stroller. He had like one of those baby wraps. And the little doggy was in the baby wrap, which fits perfectly with what we've been talking about with sex, because sex is about connection. Sex is about connection. You guys keep your mind out of the gutter. And uh, in particular today, there was, he wasn't connecting with his dog uh, Mentally, obviously, they weren't in deep conversation. There was, a, there was a physicality to it. There was a touch, like keeping, you know, keeping the dog close. And so today, we're going to talk about that. Uh, and before I get into that, though, we are, uh, we're, as we've been talking about sex, sometimes in churches, when there's talk about sex, there's a lot of condemnation. There's a lot of guilt. There's a lot of shame. And I hope that that is not what's being projected and has not been projected. And I want to say it again, I want you to internalize this and remember it throughout today's teaching as well, is that our God is a God of grace. He is gracious. And he wants to heal us of our brokenness, where we are broken, everywhere we are broken. And so connected to that, my main point today, our main point today, is that the body is good. More than that, your body is good. The body is good, your body is good. And to unpack that from the Bible, we're going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So if you have your Bible, you can open up there. We're going to pretty much stay in 1 Corinthians 6 most of the morning. But before I read it, I want to make three uh, preliminary statements so that as we read things will make a little more sense. The first is that the letter of 1 Corinthians is written to a brand new church in Corinth. Paul is writing this letter to new Christians, and these new Christians are different than a lot of the other Christians around the empire in that they don't come from the Jewish faith. They weren't Jews that converted to Christianity on the whole. They were Gentiles that converted to Christianity. In other words, they were like Greco-Roman cultured people. And with that Greco-Roman cultured pagan culture, if you will, uh, they brought in that pagan worldview, and they brought in that pagan ethic, and in particular, they brought in that pagan sexual ethic, and their world, like our world today, was a sexually charged culture. Like, culture, sex was worshipped. Sex was seen as the highest in some case, you know, it was, it was done in the temples. Like, to worship, you would go to the temple and have sex with a prostitute. Like, that was the highest level of experience. I don't think that's far off from our world today, because what's the highest level of experience? Do you go to church for that? Most of the culture would say no. You go, you know, like, it's sex. That's the highest level of experience. So that's statement one. Statement two is, as we read, and this is true whenever we read Paul, if you see the word Lord in Paul, he's talking about Jesus. So you hear Lord, you hear Christ, Think Jesus. And finally, this passage in particular, it's very important to pay attention to where the quotation marks are. If you don't follow the quotation marks, it's going to get very confusing and very twisted. So where you see quotation marks, that's where Paul is engaging with what the Corinthians think. So Paul, as a pastor, is trying to pastor this church through this letter, and so he's in conversation. The quotation marks are what the Corinthians are saying, and then Paul responds to what the Corinthians are saying after the quotation marks. Okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. 
See the quotation marks? I have the right to do anything, you say. But Paul says, responds to that, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, right? They're saying, and Paul responds, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. End quotation marks. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one, of, is one with her in her body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So there's a lot there. We're just going to start at the top and work through uh, this passage. So 1 Corinthians 6, back to verse 12. They say, I have the right to do anything. Paul responds, but not everything is beneficial. They say, again, I have the right to do anything. Paul says, but I will not be mastered, about, uh, be mastered by anything. And what Paul is in conversation here with this church about is about Christian freedom. Because they believe, and we believe, that when you start following Jesus, when you've received Jesus, you have this incredible freedom that you didn't have before. There's a bunch of like religious expectations that now aren't going to bear down on your shoulders. You're free from that. But Paul is saying, you can abuse your freedom, and that will actually turn back into slavery. You can use your freedom and then be mastered by these things and your freedom. Here's what I mean. So if you're 18, you have the right to buy uh, cigarettes. Okay, I'm not making sin statements here. I'm just, you have the right to buy cigarettes. You can got, buy cigarettes. You can smoke those cigarettes. You can form the habit of smoking cigarettes, and that can turn into an addiction to cigarettes. And suddenly, where you were once free, now you're enslaved again because addiction is slavery. You can't help. You, don't, you no longer get to choose whether or not you smoke. You're addicted. The cigarettes, in a sense, choose for you. And this can apply to all sorts of different things, things that are good, things that are neutral. It can be, you know, you have the right to go onto Facebook. But you can form a habit of being on Facebook, first thing in the morning, last thing at night, and suddenly you don't have a choice on whether you just find yourself on Facebook. It's like, it's like you're a slave to Facebook. Facebook has become your master. But what slavery is Paul speaking to here specifically? Let's look at verse 13 here. He's giving us a clue. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. Now this phrase, food for the body, the body for food, is a phrase that would have, was very common across the Roman Empire. People said it all the time. And it basically is saying, if you're hungry, eat. If you're thirsty, drink. And what this is really all about is if you want to have sex, then have sex. So food for the body, the body for food, is code word for, right? It's the nice way of saying sex for the body and the body for sex, which is an excuse to have sex with whoever you want, right? You should follow your cravings. And, and we have certain phrases in our culture, too, that, that line up with this. We don't say food for the body, the body for food. We say things like, the heart wants what it wants, or it's only natural, or uh, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> Am I right? So Allison is going to unpack that a little bit more for us. Good. So Paul is addressing this faulty worldview here, right? This comes from Plato. And Plato was the premier philosopher of the time, and he, 
to many ends he still is in the Western world. We still follow his teachings. And he would say that the physical is a broken, damaged version of the perfect spiritual reality. So in essence, the body is bad, the spirit is good. The body is just a collection of needs. And so we thirst and we hunger and we need sleep and we need sex. And in that passage, he says, God will destroy them both, meaning your bodies are finite, so it doesn't actually really matter what you do with them in the meantime. While you're here trapped in your body, just follow your impulses. Just do what feels good. Right? Yeah, that's Plato, not Paul, not the Bible. Remember? Right, right. <clears throat> that's what he's addressing. <laughs> so that's one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, if you read just past where we finished reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, listen to this. Now for the matters you wrote about, quotation mark, right? This is not Paul, quotation mark. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, right? Like, don't have sex ever, never. The view here on the other end of the spectrum is sex is dirty. And if you're having sex, you should only be doing it when you're trying to procreate, have, make babies. Like, if you're not trying to make a baby, then you shouldn't have sex because sex is dirty. That's the other end of the spectrum. So on the one hand, there is sex and the body viewed as an animal. We can't tame it, so we just indulge it. In the passage that Amos just read, we're talking about avoiding it, stuffing it down. This is where we would say the church has camped out for a long time to say, deny your desires. Stuff them down, they're dangerous. If we talk about them, they're going to lead to sin. Our culture is on the other end of the pendulum saying, just go for it and indulge in whatever you want to do. And I find it really interesting and actually really ironic that the church has adopted the view that sex is bad and our bodies are bad because it goes against our Christian theology. Right? We assent to the fact that Jesus was in a body he walked and talked and breathed and sweat and touched people. Yeah, so this... <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> if you would just say, and now it's your turn, then I'll know. <laughs> okay, so this actually finds expression uh, in a really fascinating person in particular. Uh, do you guys know who Hugh Hefner is? For those of you who don't know who Hefner, now do you know who he is? He was the founder of the Playboy Empire. The Playboy Empire is probably the most well-known pornographic magazine. Uh, incredible objectification of women. And uh, what I didn't know until recently, he was raised by very, very religious Christian parents. Puritans. So he was raised with the idea that sex is dirty, and his parents only had sex for the purpose of having children. Think of like Victorian era, you know, man and woman, husband and wife sleeping in separate beds. So he grew up with this repressed view of sex, which wasn't satisfying to him, so he swung to the complete opposite end of the spectrum and creating this pornographic empire. You can almost hear Hugh Hefner saying, right? Sex for the body, the body for sex. So what Paul is trying to do here is cut through the middle. He's saying we're not animal, we're not angel. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be human? So in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 13, but we'll just stop, start at the top of that verse, he says, you say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality. And if you were on Facebook with us this past week, I put a little clip up from Tim Keller explaining the word porneia, the Greek, the language in its original form, is porneia. So 
sexual immorality. The body was not meant for, for sexual immorality, but what is the body for? For the Lord. And the Lord for the body. This is pretty incredible. This is a surprise. You're thinking he's going to, you know, sex for the body, the body for sex. Instead, we've got the body for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And this would have been not just surprising to them. This is surprising to us because usually when we think about our relationship with Jesus, we're only thinking about the spiritual realm. Uh, So when I pray, then I'm connected with Jesus. Or when I come to church, then I'm connected with Jesus. But Paul is saying, no, your body is connected with Jesus. So in other words, when you go to work, you're connected with Jesus. Jesus is in you. Jesus is doing something to you, for you. You were made for Jesus at work. When you're at home with your family, when you're out and about, when you're walking through the park, whatever it, if Jesus is connected to you in your body, wherever you go, there he is too, right? Like you can't, I don't know about you guys, I don't have a lot of out-of-body experiences. Like where you go, where your body is, there you are, and there Jesus is. Does this make sense? Your body was not, your body was made for the Lord. Your body was made for Jesus. This is the first affirmation in this passage that the body is good, really good. Here's the second. 1 Corinthians 16, 6, verse uh, right, 14. By his power, God raised the Lord Jesus from the dead, and he will raise us also. Now, Allison is going to, again, fill that out for us. I think that is an amazing statement. If you just take a second to think about what God is saying in that moment. He is saying, Jesus' body is good. And he is saying, Jesus' resurrection is the affirmation that our bodies are good. So if we think about this, if Jesus' body was trash, if he didn't need it, he would have returned as a spirit. The tomb wouldn't have been empty his flesh would still be laying there and he would have just come back as a spirit, right? And in fact, that's what the disciples were anticipating. That's what they were expecting. So they were astonished and even scared when they found him walking around in this body that they recognized. And my favorite part in this is Thomas was the disciple in the crowd that was known as the doubter. And when Jesus encounters Thomas after the resurrection. Thomas says, I am not going to believe you unless I can touch you. And Jesus, to everybody's surprise, doesn't meet him with shame or guilt or condemnation or say, oh, you don't have enough faith. What do you mean? I'm right here. He says, put your hands in my wounds. Go ahead. Eat my flesh. Drink my blood touch me. And that is communion language. Every time we take the bread, we drink the wine, what are we doing? We're putting Jesus in our body. We're remembering that his sacrifice was physical and that we are one with him in that moment. So this might sound a little abstract, hard to swallow, we'll bring it down and try to talk about some practical applications now about this, okay? So if we think and believe that sex is central to what it means to be human, and we were created in God's image, then he must also desire that we become more fully human, that we we live out of this healthy place and expression of our sexuality. And I think the way that we have to start is to acknowledge that desire is good. Hunger, thirst, appetite, this is good. It's actually necessary. If your body didn't crave food and you didn't eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day, what happens? You actually die. So we need desire. We have to be feeling these things because that's what drives us to Jesus. It drives us toward relationship with him and with other people. Similarly, like a car engine 
it's neutral, right? It's the thing that gets us from point A to point B. And you can say that's a powerful engine. You can say that engine is broken. You can even say it's really revved up, right? But it's not bad in and of itself. Are we talking about cars or something else? We're talking about, yeah, exactly. Oh, okay, See, sorry. you're following the line. <laughs> Sex, your body, not bad. You can be revved. OK, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> so we find desire language all over the Bible. So in the Old Testament, we hear uh, about how we're to long for God like a deer pants for a drink of water. That's pretty intense. And then when Paul writes about heaven in the New Testament, it's we anticipate it, we look forward to it, we're eager, we're excited. There's longing and desire for heaven. <coughs> what do you want? That is the first question that Jesus asked anybody who said, I want to follow you. What do you want? And I think that that's actually the question that's underneath all other things that he says. You know, people ask these funny things and he's just constantly trying to probe below the surface. What do you really want? And of course, it's not because Jesus doesn't know the answer, right? It's because he's trying to point us toward our desires. And what I want you to hear is that we are actually more controlled by the desires that we are not aware of, that we repress, than the ones that we acknowledge. And I say that again. The desires that you aren't aware that are lurking be below the surface, those are the ones that control your actions. Those are the ones that bubble up and spill out over into your life. That was the case for Hugh Hefner, right? He repressed this, and it came out in destructive and impulsive behavior. So today we call that impulse buying, right? So for me, it's haagen ice cream. That is my impulse. So if I've had a really bad day at work, I'm feeling really beat up, I can easily find myself in the parking lot of Giant to buy raspberry white chocolate truffle ice cream. But what do I really want? Do I really want the ice cream? Yeah, maybe. But what's under that is I want comfort. I want acceptance. I want to know that I'm OK, ultimately. So our desires either point us toward God or away from God. right? And I found that this concept of consolation and desolation is extremely helpful in discerning desires. And what I mean by that is we're constantly probing and taking our pulse of our emotions, right? So how, how do I feel about my spouse today? How do I feel about my body today? How do I feel about that hot neighbor boy when I see him go get his mail every day? Right? What am I feeling? I, I don't <laughs> Good I job. Don't know. Sometimes they're listening so well. I know. They're just, uh, they, you didn't know I had a hot neighbor boy, did you? Yeah. Are you talking about Paul? Oh, not Paul, yeah. <laughs> My neighbor is named Paul, not Paul in the Bible. For that instance, would be awkward. Sorry. I, I'm ruining it. It's all right. Oh, so basically, it's much easier for us to just say, our bodies are bad. It's just easier. It's just easier to say, nope, I'm just going to shove it away. They're bad. It's too hard. It's hard to do the work of training your mind and your body to want something else, to want the good thing. I really like teaching with Allison because she gets to take care of the really hard, serious, meaty stuff, and then I get to tell the jokes. <clears throat> but uh, I, want you to, I want you to listen to my words very closely. I don't want any say, what? You guys in the cafe, too. Um, I'm attracted to other women. You can quote me on that, but don't misquote me. Here's the I'm attracted to other women, and I think that's a good thing. And here's why. Because we've been talking about this. We are attracted to things because they're good, because they're beautiful. If we're attracted, to, we want money because money is good and it can do good things. We want food because food is good and it can do good things. 
we're attract, we want sex because sex is good. It's a gift from God. And so for me to say I'm attracted to women, I'm saying like women are beautiful. Like women are physically beautiful and they are beautiful in their personhood. And so I think it's actually healthy that I am attracted to women, other women. Now, can that attraction turn into something sinful, something lustful, something where I turn it into fantasy, something where it becomes sexual immorality? Well, of course it can. But the attra- here's what I want you to hear. The attraction itself is not sin. It's not wrong. It's actually, it's really, really right. And this is something that Allison and I will actually talk about pretty freely and pretty openly. And what I don't mean is that she's not my, she's not my accountability partner, if you know what that is. And, if there, and at times when I need accountability partners, I say, hey, I'm going to talk to somebody about this, but there's, you, know, you don't need... But anyway, um, but what we will talk about is, you know, is it appropriate, do you think, is it wise, are you okay with me carpooling with this woman who's not you? Or I met with this person in a counseling session, do you think it's healthy or wise to keep meeting on an ongoing basis with so-and-so? Yeah. I, this really works for us, and Amos will often say when we're out at a restaurant or a party, um, I really like that dress, and it's not the one that I'm wearing, right? <laughs> <laughs> not all the time. And not all the time. He'll say, oh, I really like that dress, and what I, what I know that he means is, actually, I think that the girl wearing the dress looks really good in that dress. That's what he's actually saying, and so... I have to be secure enough, though, to recognize he's just noticing beauty. He's not sinning in that. He's just saying, that's beautiful. And so rather than shame him for that, we talk about it, and we get to celebrate that there are beautiful things, and and his desires stay in the light so that they're focused on the good. Yeah, and just to interject, like, she really has never done anything to make me feel shame. Like, it's incredible. Um, That doesn't mean I haven't felt shame from time to time. But, I mean, she's always been gracious. And uh, did you say, like, when things are out in the light, they just have less potential to go to dark places, to to grow roots that that are unhealthy. And uh, don't, again, don't hear me wrong, guys. You can take this and run with it and take it to the wrong extreme. Like, this doesn't give you permission to check, to click on the erotic image that shows up on your whatever Facebook feed, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. But to realize that other women are attractive and beautiful, I think that's good. Sorry. Yeah. I don't know. That's great. I think the other thing that's important to remember is when you get married or when you start having a relationship with someone, your sexuality doesn't just magically appear. Right? Like you weren't sexual beforehand and now suddenly you're in this relationship and so oh my gosh, now I have all these feelings. No, it's been with you all along. So whether you're single or married or widowed, you're meant for connection, and embracing your sexuality is actually a way that we connect. And Jesus, who was not married, is the best model for this. I just love this. He, when a prostitute approaches him and wipes his feet with her hair and pours perfumed oil all over her, my reaction would be like, oh, get away, distance. But what does he do? He embraces her. He values her. He says, I'm going to touch you. The rest of society has said, you're not clean. But I say, I'm going to touch you. I'm going to be in relationship with you, not just spiritually, but physically in relationship with people. So sexuality is about connection. That's what I want you to hear today. It's about connection, but as we talk about it, it also brings up all of this awareness of how severed we are, right? How cut off we are from ourselves. We're disconnected from people, from God, and actually even from our own bodies. And so 
the way that this plays out, I think, particularly for women, is we have this self-hatred or this self-loathing, right? It, it's one thing to know that my body is good and that God says it's good, but it's an entirely different thing for me to walk that out every day because the messages I'm getting is that you're just not quite good enough, right? There's a standard out there and you can't measure it. You're never going to measure up. And I think the other thing that we have to keep in mind is the reality of sexual abuse. And we need to be aware as a church of this reality because the statistics do not even begin to touch the pain and shame of living in your own skin after it's been violated. So this is not my story, but if it is your story, know that there is hope and that God is for you and touches you and wants to resurrect your body too. Yeah. And if that is you, if that is your story, I think, I think you need to hear these words. We all need to hear these words, but especially if you are self-loathing, self-loathing, and this is a male and female issue, and especially if you've been sexually abused. And I have counseled men who have been sexually abused. Uh, it happens. These are Paul's words. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. There is no higher compliment than what Paul is saying here. Not only were temples in the ancient world the most beautiful and the most ornate and the most expensive and the most honored places, the most honored buildings that you could enter. More than that, temples were the place where heaven and earth got very thin. Temples were the place where God would dwell, where his presence would be. And here Paul is saying, your body is that temple. Your body is beautiful. And beyond the value, beyond the incredible priceless value that Jesus is putting on your body, that Paul is putting on your body, that God is declaring upon your body, there's a connection to healing as well here. Because when Jesus touched people, when Jesus touched people that the society had declared unclean, whether it be a leper or a bleeding woman, that person became clean. And this works against how it typically works in the real world because usually when something dirty touches something clean, now we've got two dirty things. And the ancient religions would took that realism and created religious theology around it. So if you were spiritually unclean and you touched someone who was spiritually clean, the clean person would become dirty. Not so with Jesus. When Jesus touches a person, power flows out from him and causes that person to be clean. Because Jesus has touched you, because the Holy Spirit dwells in you, therefore, you are clean. That is powerful. And I'm going to finish today, and I'm going to finish my portion of this Sex God series uh, by reading from a book titled Sex God 
by Rob Bell. And I, rec I recommend the book. But this is at the end of a chapter called Sexy on the Inside. He says, you can't be connected with God until you're at peace with who you are. If you're still upset that God gave you this body or this life or this family or these circumstances, you will never be able to complete or connect with God in a healthy, thriving, sustainable sort of way. You'll be at odds with your maker. And if you can't come to terms with who you are and the life you've been given, you'll never be able to accept others and how they were made and the lives they've been given. And until you're at peace with God and those around you, you will continue to struggle with your role on the planet, your part to play in the ongoing creation of the universe. You will continue to struggle and resist and fail to connect. The other day, my five-year-old son asked my wife, Mom, what does sexy mean? Can you imagine? She thought about it for a second and then replied, sexy is when it feels good to be in your own skin. Your own body feels right. It feels comfortable. Sexy is when you love being you. Because it all starts with being sexy on the inside. Would you stand? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come, and we believe that you already dwell in our body because we're a temple, but we ask that you would come in power and bring your healing, just as you did so many times in the New Testament. I pray that people here who are desperate for you, who are hungering and thirsting for you, that you would come and meet them and feel, fill them, refill them with your spirit. I pray that any here who have just a hard time believing that they are beautiful, that they are lovely, that they are worthy, that as we now step into this next song, that you would speak to them, that there would be dialogue between you and them. So speak to us. We need to hear your voice. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.